This is a land of bare essentials, inhabited by four seasons and the wind under an infinite sky, and by little else. It is possible here to make a complete circle with your eye and see but one house, or one person, or nothing at all. It is possible to go for days in silence. What it is not possible to do here is to live without examining the meaning of your existence. Almost nothing stands between this man and the relentless winds that blow down upon his home all year long. Certainly no trees have ever grown here of their own free will. For eight years, Rocky Stramel has been planting trees, a living shelter belt against the wind, protection for his family, his crops, his livestock. There's a reason why this country isn't full of people. Mostly it's the wind. Wind is nice, a breeze is nice. But when I'm talking of wind, I'm talking 40, 50 mile an hour stuff where you can't hardly stand in it. In fact, it gets so bad here in the wind that I am utterly amazed that there is any animals left alive. Cows, horses, anything. I am utterly amazed that anything is left alive. But when the winds are blowing and it's so miserable away from a tree that you, you can't hardly stand being out and that you'll walk 50 feet and get behind the shelter belt and the wind's calm and pheasant tracks up and down it and bunny tracks, then you remember all the times you sweated and pulled weeds, that it was worth it and it, it is serving its purpose. 20,000 trees planted, watered, and cared for by hand. Where does a person find the patience and the strength to do something like this? Sometimes I get to thinking we've got such good, beautiful buffalo grass. But sometimes I get to thinking that that is just what God put there until you could do something else with it. He has instructed his people to occupy and to produce. And so I guess what I am doing out here is, is taming the ground, making this land something so it isn't just a windswept, semi-arid, rough country. Rocky and Shonda Strammel beheld in this wilderness a home. I used to drive right through this pasture on my way to check cattle. So as we were looking, we came to this place and we decided that this is where our house would be. So we took an old lath and drove it in the ground and hung an old sock or something on it for a flag and we prayed over it and asked God to bless it. There was nothing here but an occasional gopher or a lizard running through the yucca plants. But now it's a farmstead. Now it's a, it's a home. Before you guys came, the only people out here was Shonda and I. There are no people. Uh, I can go for weeks on the roads and, and between the cattle out here, weeks. And I may never see a soul. So. That, and you need a friend, you need somebody to talk to. And that's, oh. sometimes that's all we have. Also, we work together a lot. I go with Rocky and help him with the farm, and we build fence together and check cattle together. And, and it's sure nice to be with somebody that you're a friend with, you know what I mean? There are times when you need to just go and have someone else to tell your troubles to. I've just longed for some company. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Since your wife or your husband is the only one you see, they get everything, all your good, all your trash, everything. Sometimes it's just too much. Hosanna to the King. 
To this church that Shonda's grandfather helped build, families from 50 miles around come every Sunday for the companionship which they all crave, and to join their voices and hopes together in prayer. Hallelujah. We exercised patience for a few days, and then it began to rain. And we thank you, Father, again, that you've caused it to rain. We thank you for the abundance of rain. You've just again shown yourself strong on the behalf of those who will trust you. I know when I go to town, it's I talk all the time because, uh, you know, I'm trying to make up for two weeks. It seems like the best part of church is after church is when we get to all talk and say how our week's gone and discuss all our agriculture needs and, and things, but we're real close. The flame of fellowship burns warmly, but briefly, for Rocky and Shonda. When it's time to say goodbye and drive the long road home, they must take as much of this good feeling with them as they can. It'll have to last them all week. When you consider who you're related to beyond your immediate family, you probably think about your culture, that unique combination of people and place you'll always feel at home with, no matter how far you travel. Like the way the people at this dance feel about one another. Having a culture is being able to just look at certain people and know what they've been up against and what they hold dear in life. Because they're your people, and you understand them, Photographer Terry Evans loves her prairie culture. She's known throughout the state for her images of this land and its people. Today, she takes her camera into the heart of a prairie family. At a gathering at the home of Marinelle Reese, Terry looks beyond the present. She can see a stream of history that flowed into this family from one of the great traditions of the plains. Strong women who met life head on, whose hands held rifles and plows, who baked bread and nursed babies. A tradition of women who helped build a civilization. Coming from this tradition, it isn't surprising that the four daughters of Marinelle Reese have distinguished themselves in the fields of law, the arts, business, and medicine. They've inherited the social consciousness and self-knowledge of their prairie ancestors. The prairie gets to you. I love the prairie. And I grew up in the far western part of the state where it's all sky and prairie. But you have a sense of both roots and vision. And I think those two things mean a lot to me. And I wanted to be sure that my girls, or had they been boys, boys and girls, my children, had roots and a love for what they came from because that meant a lot to me. And it had influenced my life. The neighbors I knew, the prairie I grew up on, the ancestry I had. And I wanted to be sure that, but I didn't want them to limit their horizons. I'm hoping that some of this will come through, this kind of, um, of I don't know, it's like uh, this, this kind of wholeness that in your in your family that you reflect. You get this set up. Okay, let's put the chair about there. Perhaps a yeah. hundred years from now, in a Kansas we can only imagine, a young woman will look into this portrait of Marinelle Reese and her daughters, seeking inspiration from her own past. You get your own pictures taken. That's true. Can you spread out a little bit, but more kind of circle around your mom? Jane Ann, let me see how it looks with your hand sort of Around your mother's the environment of Kansas tends to support vision. I think it's a visionary state that we're not often thought of that way. I can't reach. Can't reach? Okay. But you can see beyond your borders. And that plus the wide spaces, 
the open sky, the tendency to dream, to look ahead. I, it's had an effect, I think, on lots of Kansans. I think it definitely has had an effect on me and probably through that to my own daughters. Kansas has always produced strong, visionary women who could see beyond their borders. Think about a little girl from Atchison named Amelia Earhart, who followed her vision and became one of America's greatest pioneering aviators. Even today, 50 years after she vanished somewhere over the South Pacific, the memory of Amelia still has the power to inspire dreams in others. It was dreams of flight that transformed Wichita, Kansas from a cow town into one of the centers of the aviation industry. Today, 60% of the world's general aviation aircraft roll out of the hangars at Cessna, Boeing, Lear, and Beach corporations. That quest for flight took man to places he'd never been before and showed him his old familiar home in a brand new way. To fly over the ground and see all of this natural graphic imagery that the people who work the land have carved out of the ground without even realizing the aesthetic appeal or aesthetic value of it. But here on a 20 acre field, a young Kansas artist has etched a different sort of image, the product of his own monumental vision. Stan Hurd discovered that paint on canvas just wasn't enough to express his personal experience of the prairie. I have always had a sense, I think, as a young man on a tractor, of, of the feeling of, of what it might look like from the air, the fact that I was on the earth and that the birds flying over would look down and see me and see this, you know, this strip of land I'm laying. And if I jagged out and fell asleep at the tractor, you know, how visible it would be, or the jet airplanes flying over what they might look and see. Stan has the eye of a painter and the soul of a farmer. His tractor is his brush. His colors, the delicate hues of prairie grasses. Your average artist steps back a few feet to view his work. But when your canvas is a half mile wide, you need a bit more distance. When I did the first field work, I got the feeling that a lot of people considered it on the level of, of trying to get 15 people into a phone booth. You know, this was another Guinness's Book of World Records. Giant, fantastic thing, and, and, uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a very serious thing for me. It was a very serious art form. One of the revelations was my feelings on the immensity of a field and the size of a state and the size of the globe. And I would work and work on these 160 acre, half mile by half mile portraits, and then fly over at 10,000 feet and it was a spot. It was like somebody dropped a postage stamp on the floor. And uh, realizing, you know, just how small we are. Like many artists, Stan Hurd has patrons. What are you doing, Junior? But his aren't the fashionable types that stand around at cocktail parties. Won't take long. They're people of the earth. Farmers like Butch and Junior Nice. Butch, what are you doing? Oh, not much. Who help Stan out because they really do understand this unusual young man. All right, here we go. Oh, man. He's one of their own. Their minds are open to the meaning of his art. I've used their equipment, I've used their fuel, I've used their labor, I've taken up their time. When should we try to get these in the ground? What is it? Any time, quicker the better. Is it's, it's kind of hard for me to keep coming back to these folks and, and asking them, you know, let's grow another season. I mean, this 20 acres here would be tall and soybeans in about two weeks if it wasn't for this project. So it's taking money out of their pocket in a sense. Uh, $15 a bag on these critters. Thank you, gentlemen. Butch and Junior know it takes a real prairie man to even think of something like this, let alone to do it. At this point, it will be uh, impossible probably to keep me off the ground in some sense. I don't believe that I could stop it if I wanted to. What I have done 
will change the face of this little patch of planet probably for many, many, many years. You know, there's a message in Kansas that speaks quietly to our space age. It's that we humans, we're still very much a part of the Earth. And the Earth is still the mother we return to at the end of all our travels. Always there has been a part of our Earth that's been in the custody of families who've lived close to the seeds they planted and reaped who passed on the knowledge of a lifetime to their children. But fewer and fewer people are able to live that way now. That ancient system of stewardship, the family farm, is passing out of existence. Tom Giesel is exhausted. He and his brother Jay have worked into the dawn trying to get their hay off the wet ground. They're getting just a bit nervous because if this hay doesn't get raked pretty soon, it could rot, and there'd go months of work. Well, where'd this fog come from, anyway? Well, I don't know. It's not too, <laughs> it's not too good for hay. And... You know, we go out, About and we're gone all night. The yeah, there's a tremendous physical burden. On. Wind comes up. That's part Let's of it. Let's try it there. there. Let's try it go there a little bit see. more and see what happens. Where it makes it a little more difficult with the situation the way it is and with agriculture today, you have to push yourself to the absolute limits, physically, mentally, emotionally. You cannot make the wrong turn. You can't plant the wrong direction. You can't sell the wrong day. You do any one of these things wrong, any little thing wrong, you're out. Well, let's take a look at that. I'm afraid I know what's going to be. Boy, that's awful raggy. Yeah, it is. Not more it takes such a long time to learn to be a Maybe farmer and not much time at all to lose a farm. What do you think? Oh, let's shut her down. Tell you what, why don't we try to get a little bit of sleep? A couple there of is no doubt that we have went farther than, and then just teetering with the idea of losing a generation of farmers. I can think of a half dozen of my friends that I went to school with that are out this year alone. And that is an extremely serious problem. Family farming isn't just an occupation, it's a calling, a commitment to live your life a certain way. That's how it is inside the family farm home, too. No separation between life and work. Hi, honey. Tom's ready for some well-earned rest, but his wife Cheryl's day is just beginning. How are you? Tired. How's my kids today? Did you get a bail last night? Tried to do a little raking this morning. We just finally gave up. It just, just got too wet, too fast. It just wouldn't go. Well, it's sort of like having two marriages. One to your husband and the commitment that's involved there, and one to the farm. And are you going to be here for dinner? Better not plan on it, because I just don't know what I'm going to be doing and which way I'm going. Because there's just certain times of the year that the farm and its demands are going to come first. You know, I should have known <laughs> when we tried to set our wedding date that there might have been some question here just about what came first and when, because we kept moving our wedding date. We had to uh, wait till the wheat was planted, and we had to wait till the milo was in, and we had to, you know, it just kept pushing it off here, and I'm going, now, are we getting married or what, Giesel? Are you going to town pretty soon? Yes, I am. I'm going to town this morning. I have a whole list. Well, here, add one. What happened? Crimper bearing on the swather. I was not like, raised on the farm. It don't look like that. It looks like it should look like it. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it's been a learning experience, but it was something I had no idea I was getting into. All right. I thought I was marrying a rich farmer, too. That was another misconception. <laughs> you have to feel for a young farm family. There's so much to think about, so many dangers and pitfalls, and you never know what's around the corner. Greetings, how are you all this morning? Your old biddy's been a laying pretty heavy for me today. Arthur Saylor's been around the block many times, and there isn't much that worries him. He's seen the worst this kind of life can dish out, and he's lived long enough to enjoy the best of it. 
You know, they began to talk a little bit about hard times. And I said a lot of times, if there's going to get terrible hard times, I hope it's while some of us old boys are alive yet that went through the Depression. I, I think I think it needs some of us around because, you know, reading something, that don't, that's not as good as having somebody to tell you. This old man's been through things most of us can't imagine. He remembers the 1930s and the days of the Dust Bowl. Six years of drought and despair, six years of no crop, no money, and almost no hope. It just looked like a cloud, you know, it might rain and it would just, it was black, it was solid dirt. A person be outside, you know, and, and see a cloud coming like that, why, he just knew, you know, it'd just be a little bit until a thing got here, cut, lands of living, and uh, uh, naturally everybody would go at the house. It really was terrible, just, you know, just blow all the topsoil off. And a guy kind of bringing a new wife out from Wisconsin, <laughs> that made it worse yet. Well, I wasn't thinking of anything. I loved him and I was glad to come. But when I got here, this is where I live now. This is my home. Uh, was I foolish to come out here in these wide open spaces? I lived in the hills. It was an entirely different country and you just adjusted to it. Arthur had lived here all of his life, didn't know anything else. He said, stick it out, and we did. You've got to be proud of the place where you live. And I suppose one thing I thought all the time, it might be one reason that I'm as optimistic as I am about everything is because she is pessimistic. <laughs> That's the truth. And, and I hold up. I hold up. He's <laughs> Can't got get to. Me Somebody to. has to. <laughs> the word farmer is a masculine sounding noun in the singular. But really, a farmer has always been two people a man and a woman, partners in the labor of bringing food out of the earth, together for better and for worse throughout the cycles of life. Not too long ago, a family lived on this farm, and this now empty house was filled with the sound of their voices. But now they, and thousands like them, are gone from here, swallowed up somewhere in America. Now the fields of this farm are for rent. Tom and Cheryl are thinking about taking them on. Really, the building's in pretty good shape yet. Yeah, they really are. You can tell they were taken care of. Yeah, and you got some usable stuff, too, here with the barn. What to do? Do you stick with what you've got? Or do you take yet another risk? It's a big decision. And like Giesel says, you make that one wrong move, and you've had it. It's this quarter and that 80 right west of it. Hmm. I don't know, honey. You guys are putting up so much hay now. It's quite a commitment. Well, as close as this is to home, I think we can handle it. And we'll be tearing up some other hay, so it, it'll it work out. I really do. I think now is the time to take advantage. To be a farmer today, you've got to watch where you spend your money and what for. That, that's, that's my opinion. Well, I know that's the way that I made a go of it. Well, I'm 78 years old, and you're here and all the time. My, that old boy lived a good long life and one thing or another, but I just, I just hoped that I could just keep on a few more years, <laughs> not exactly the way that I'm doing. Arthur Saylor's earned the right to speak. He's fought many battles, and he's won his peace. The Giesel family is surviving, too. Their hay crop is in, and for the moment, there's a sense of completion. A feeling that life, on this farm at least, is good. Trailblazer, okay? Whoop! You just don't look now. Let's just go on. We, we could have some pretty good times out here, couldn't we? Won't be long and be combine time, won't? Yep. Yep. This our wheat. Yep. This is our wheat. We're kind of proud of it, aren't we?
Out on the plains of western Kansas, there's a fast, rough game being played called the oil and gas business. No matter how that market jumps around, there's always someone willing to gamble on drilling a deep, expensive hole in the ground out here because there's more oil under this prairie than in all but seven other states. For many Americans, the workplace has become a civilized and tastefully carpeted environment. But not the drilling rig. It's still the same screaming, dirty, and dangerous monster that has been for 60 or 70 years. Few men quit this work with as many fingers as they started with. This kind of work isn't just tough on the roughnecks, though. It's also pretty tough on the nerves of Randy Hutchinson and Jim Harden two young wildcat oil men. This is not a game for the squeamish, the oil and gas business. It's a game for people who do have confidence in yourselves, in your decisions. One mistake, you know, and thousands and thousands of dollars down the drain. Anything can happen. One day we're depressed, and the next day we're happy. We're buying champagne. Yeah. <laughs> or vice versa. Or vice versa. We've got champagne one day, and then the next day we have Absolutely nothing. It took Jim and Randy a long time to find this spot. They covered a lot of ground and read a lot of maps and surveys. Come here, Randy. Now they read the Earth's layers, and each one yields more information. Right in there? Yeah. Isn't that great? I'll tell you, they really make me feel... I feel better about the test all the time the more I look at the rocks. But it takes more than a college degree and a microscope to find oil. What are you calling it here? Yeah. You also need quite a bit of that good old-fashioned mystery ingredient. The sixth sense it takes to be an oil man, I think a lot of that is something called luck. That's and if right. you're lucky, whether you're drilling wells or shooting dice, then good things will happen to you. Yeah. Dissolve in that acid. There's a lot of complete saturation on these samples, which I didn't expect out of a gassy area. That's right. You know, we could easily pull some oil on this test. So far, everything's looking good. In a business that's known more than its share of desperados, a man's lucky to have a partner he can trust. I think Randy and I complement each other real well. We're watching one another, and that's yeah. and we yeah. get along good enough to where if I tell him, hey, I think you're doing this wrong, he doesn't get offended, and vice versa. He can do the same How do you know? <laughs> well, you let me know next time, and we'll see. It's not only your partner's trust you need, you also need to convince a bunch of other people to let you use their money. Jim and Randy's investors are the proverbial just plain folks. Mostly local business people, a few friends, and even a relative or two. This morning, we should five or six this morning be cutting into the arm up the top. And they all have two things in common. A little extra cash and a lot of confidence in Jim and Randy. Be having the tool in the hole. Happy Father's Day for us and hey. Yeah, that'll be a nice deal, won't it? We don't have any Wall Street brokers in on this stuff. They're California realtors. It's just a bunch of good people. But they're the backbone of the they're business. The of so the we've business. got to look out right. for those investors or and we would have no business. They're the lifeblood so. of our business. I, as right now, I'm as confident as I could ever be right now. Six thirty the next morning, the bit finally breaks through the Arbuckle zone. The pipe's coming back up to the surface with the answer everyone's waiting for. Oh, this is essentially, I would say, at this point, a dry hole. not an oil man make, one dry hole don't put us out of the business. 
so. Every good oil man knows you can't possibly win them all. The best thing to do now is just pick yourself up and try again. Susan Coger is another self-reliant young native of Western Kansas. Hey, Don, Ron, you guys want to start dragging calves? Her home is 10,000 acres of rangeland called the Broken Heart Ranch, and she's been running it by herself since she was 18 years old. Kelly, you gonna cut? Okay, there's 150 head. Let's do it before we get rained out. My operations had a little trouble being accepted. You have the first strike against you because you're young. And uh, second of all, I happen to be female. But I've been here 11 years going on 12. And I'm here to stay. Susan was born to this way of life. Operating a big outfit like this is second nature to her. Yet she is the kind of person who needs to test herself and take risks. So not long ago, she expanded the ranch into a new business. Relax, stay outside that saddle. The training and showing of performance cutting horses. Relax. Whoa, 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 back up, back up, back up. Susan spent many years in the saddle, but she'll be the first to tell you these horses are a whole new experience. Oh. The breed goes back to the days of the open range when ranchers needed cutting horses to separate their cattle out of the herds. Today, the precise moves of this once essential working animal have been refined into a highly competitive sport. If you ever feel him going out forward, set him back, get a hold of him. Breaking into the elite world of performance yes. cutting horses isn't easy. But Susan thinks it's worth the effort. First prize oh, at the big show in Fort Worth is a quarter of a million dollars. Good, bueno. I started putting this operation together about two, two and a half years ago. And uh, I got halfway into it and started to get scared because it is a big, a, a big step. It's a financial step and an um, emotional step to take. Act like this is a show pin, this okay. is Duncan. We're going for the check right here. Okay. And, uh, but you know, it's not just the money she's after. It's the whole challenge of the thing. Just like the show. Okay. Any questions? No. Nope. Don't get going too fast. Okay, if he starts running, take that black. Pull him, pull him back to a cow. Don't let him leave. I have never in my life been so close to a way a horse thinks. Good, good. Trust him. Shit. Trust him. Leave that hand alone. The intensity that, that horse has okay. on that cow, it is awesome. Oh. And I, I've never done anything so awesome in my life. Up hand, watch your cow. Never take your hand off the cow. Leave your hand alone. I have never trusted Relax. another human right being right. or another animal as much as I trust oh, oh. the horse. Oh, now ride him over here. There. You start to feel the difference? Yeah. The feeling yeah, that's after that's you get off of a cutting good. horse. It's almost to the point of falling in love. Cold sweat, butterflies, and the only thing you think about is getting right back on that horse and going another to work with him. <laughs> now I'm going to drink a beer tonight. And another one. And another one. I believe it takes a certain type of woman to come out here and do this type of work. It's very, I can't say lonely, because I'm not lonely. It's quiet. You really have to, to know yourself. You have to be a true friend to yourself. The greatest wealth of Kansas lies not in a vault, but waves freely and gently in the summer breeze, unprotected by fences or locks. It is wheat, the staff of life of the world, 
Wheat as far as you can see across the Kansas prairie. And you could get in your car and drive all day and the view wouldn't change. Drawn by the life force within the ripening wheat, an enormous amount of energy converges upon Kansas in the days before harvest. Pouring in from all directions is this army of custom cutters. These are often man and wife teams working and traveling together on their long migration every summer through the wheat belt of America and Canada. Now all of Kansas quickens for the harvest. You hear it on the radio. You see it on the highways and on the long dirt tracks that crisscross the Golden Prairie. You read about it in the newspapers and on posters tacked onto diner walls. The experience of the harvest, like that of the prairie itself, is overwhelming. I love it. I love harvest. You know, long ago, when I went to school, you know, and it's have summer's gone, autumn is here, this is the harvest of all the year. And I wondered how they got that. That must have been in the eastern states where corn is and like that, because here, you know, it's June is the harvest here. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, it's just a nice time of the year. <laughs> the next few days can make or break the families of Tom and Jay Giesel. Their harvest can bring in a great bounty, yet there's always the chance that hail or too much rain might make meaningless their year of toil. You know, the harvest is the culmination of, of everything. It's the pinnacle of our work. We've got a tremendous investment in equipment, uh, emotions, labor, sweat, and a family commitment and a family investment. And you put all these things together, and it's a big deal. It's really a big deal. I mean, we're looking at a, a seven-day to a ten-day operation that, that means everything to us. It's a matter of do or die. So you hope that equipment holds together, you hope your emotions hold together, and you hope like the devil your family holds together because you need everybody you got for every minute of every day. Farmers plan and farmers prepare. But then they must sit in their fields and wait. They wait for the right time, for nature's own good time. You cut wheat when the wheat's ready, not too soon and not too late. Farmers know this moment. Farmers know a lot of things the rest of us don't. Things we wouldn't have any idea about. Like how to make decisions based on the smell of a summer day, the look of a distant cloud, or the sound of a kernel of wheat cracked between the teeth. Looks good, boys. Combine, Tom. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, are you guys both in there, you and Jay? Yeah, I just picked them up. motto is this year it says low and slow some people just want to go along the top you know and hurry so fast and the machines are old and 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 what's the difference if you don't get quite as much done why in the long run uh, maybe it's a day or two more work but good land to live in the main thing is 
my father always said, make every lick count. And, and you know, a person might not be a moving so fast, but I tell you, everything that you do, do it so you don't have to do it over again. That's when you, by, when nighttime comes, you've really accomplished a lot. The harvest sweeps across the land, touching everyone and everything in its path. Farm by farm, county by county, the immensity and power of the harvest draws all of Kansas together into one body. laboring amidst the engines and the great plumes of dust that rise from the fields. And once it begins, the harvest does not cease until the promise is fulfilled. Until all that has been sown is reaped. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp to our God, who covereth the heavens with clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion, for he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates. He hath blessed thy children within thee. He maketh peace in thy borders and filleth thee with the finest of the wheat. That's good, Arthur. It's just a wonderful time. It's a wonderful time. Mercy, when you get a load of wheat size and you take it in, you know, and it tastes good, and it's good color, and it's nice and clean, why, you get you get a charge out of that. And say, we never cut wheat on Sunday. Never, never have cut no wheat on Sunday. And I said, I think I'm just as well off as anybody else is. <laughs> yes, yeah, we get along just as, just as good as anybody else. Mm -hmm. Maybe a whole lot better. And so another harvest is drawing to a close. Another ending and beginning in the life of a family, in the business of a community and of a nation, in the perpetual cycle of growth within the earth. Okay. About an hour and a half, and a little sandwich. Maybe we can get there before sundown. There is triumph in this time of harvest, in these days of almost sacred weariness, in this simple sharing of food in a loving circle. Perhaps these are the real reasons why some people still choose to live this way, and why some people keep a special place in their hearts for those families who so recently knew this feeling and must spend the rest of their lives remembering it.